Okay, so these are the slides that I actually created. They're based on both the book, the um, slides that are at the ISLR book um, website, and then um, the presentation that uh, I got the link on the Slack channel. Okay. Um, yeah, awesome. so it's a tree-based methods and uh, the learning objectives today are, we're gonna use basic decision trees to model relationships between predictors and an outcome then compare and contrast these tree-based models with other model types, and then use tree-based ensemble methods to build better predictive models. Um, compare and contrast the various methods of building tree ensembles, which are a bagging, boosting, random forest, and this Bayesian additive regression tree, BART. And then there's just my source material. Okay, so uh, brief introduction. So tree-based methods involve stratifying or segmenting the predictor space into a number of simple regions. They are very simple and useful for interpretation, but basic decision trees are not competitive with the best supervised learning approaches in terms of prediction accuracy. So we also discuss this bagging random forest and boosting, um, which are called tree-based ensemble methods to grow multiple trees, which are then combined to yield a single consensus prediction. And that's um, their power there. Um, they can result in dramatic improvements in prediction accuracy, but of course there's some loss of interpretability and uh, they can be applied to both regression and classification. Okay, so regression trees. So this is um, the hitters data and it's a baseball salary uh, color coded from low blue green to high yellow. And you have a years and then hits, right? And so how would you stratify this? And uh, just by eyeballing, you can sort of see, you know, there's there seems to be uh, color coding here, similar salaries, and then maybe a group here, and then something else over here. So the simplest way is to do this as a tree, right? And um, for predicting the log salary of a baseball player, it's essentially based on the number of years that he's played here at the first split, and then the number of hits that he made in the previous year. So that's just a very brief introduction. So some terminology on trees. Um, these the splits are called internal nodes, and then these are called terminal nodes or leaves. And so I color coded them so that they look like leaves. Um, and then overall, the tree stratifies or segments the players into three regions of predictor space, right? So years that are less than four and a half, and then years that are greater than four and a half, and then segmented by hits. So over 117.5 or less than 117.5, right? And again, so R1, R2, and R3, and you'll see them here, R1, R2, and R3, are terminal nodes, leads, and the green lines here, and where the predictor space is segmented, are the internal nodes, so these brown things. Um, the number here in each leaf or terminal node is just the mean of the response for the observations that fall into that region of space. Okay. So uh, quickly, let's just interpret the results to see just how, like in a sense, how intuitive this is, right? A regression tree on the hitters data. So we can see from how the tree is constructed that years is the most important factor determining salary, right? So year uh, players with less than four and a half years have lower salaries. Um, and then given that a player is less experienced, so less than 4.5 years, the number of hits doesn't matter. So there is no split over here. Um, in terms of salary, right? But among the players that have more experience, so the more the ones that have over four and a half years, um, the number of hits that they made in the previous year does affect their salary. So with players making more hits, tending to have higher salaries than those that didn't. Um, so they say this is surely an oversimplification, right? But compared to a regression model, it's very easy to display, interpret, and explain. Okay, so now let's get into the tree building process, and this is for regression. So we're going to divide the predictor space, right? So the set of possible values. Um, I put in all this just to practice my notation also, and uh, we're going to divide it into J distinct and non-overlapping regions like we saw before, R1, R2, and R3. And um, just remember that the regions can have any shape. They don't have to be boxes or rectangles. So then for every observation that falls into a region RJ, we make the same prediction. That's just the mean of the response value in that region. And <clears throat> the goal is to find regions. So here, boxes, right, R1 through RJ, that minimize the 
RSS, and the RSS is just given by this. Um, so for each of the regions, you're summing over regions, and then the response value minus the fitted response value for that region squared. So yeah, a residual sum of squares. Um, so you, they don't have to be boxes? I thought kind of that was like the, uh, I guess- No, they don't have to be boxes, yeah. You can have other shapes. Huh. They don't really talk about that though, right? How hard it, how you might do that in here? It was in the book somewhere. Um, oh, okay. I can probably, okay. you want you want to find it? No, no, no. I'll 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 hunt. I'll hunt okay. later. I don't want to hold you up. <laughs> no, no problem. Um so unfortunately it is computationally infeasible to consider every possible partition of the feature space into J boxes. Okay. So we need to take a top-down greedy approach that is known as recursive binary splitting. And it's top-down because it begins at the top of the tree, right? And then successively splits the predictor space. And it's greedy because at each step of the tree building process, the best split is made at that particular step rather than looking ahead and picking a split that leads to you know, a better tree in some future step. Okay, so continuing, what we do is we first select the predictor xj and some cut point S, right? Such that splitting the predictor space into these two regions where XJ is less than S and or XJ is greater than or equal to S leads to the greatest possible reduction in the residual sum of squares. So then you just repeat this process looking for the best predictor and best cut point to split the data. And uh, you're splitting the two previously identified regions, not the entire predictor space. And you minimize the RSS within each of the resulting regions. And then you just continue until some stopping criterion. For example, no region will contain more than five observations. And again, we're predicting the response uh, using the mean of the training observations in that region. <clears throat> okay, but this previous method may result in a tree that overfits the data. And so why is this? Well, it's because your tree, if you only have five observations in each region is way too leafy. So that means complex. And a better strategy is to have a smaller tree with fewer splits, which will reduce the variance and lead to better interpretation of the results at a cost of a little bias, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna prune. So essentially you just grow a very large tree, T naught as before, right? And then we need to apply this cost complexity pruning to our very large tree to obtain a sequence of best subtrees as a function of this parameter alpha, right? So cost complexity pruning, um, this is given in equation 8.4, um, will minimize this whole thing. So A is just like an indexing um, parameter. It's always positive, right? Uh, I don't know how to read this. Absolute value of T is the number of terminal nodes that the subtree holds. Uh, RM is just the rectangular region or the subset of the predictor space corresponding to the mth terminal node. And then Y fitted RM is the mean response for the training observations in that region, right? So this tuning parameter alpha controls essentially a trade-off between the subtree's complexity, like the number of terminal nodes and how well it fits the training data. Um, so this is similar, you know, in principle as we've seen before, I think. Uh, where you're either controlling and or penalizing, you know, something from becoming too complex. So um, we choose this alpha, right, using k-fold cross-validation. And you essentially just repeat steps one and two. So the building of tree and then um, uh, applying this cost complexity pruning uh, to each of your folds. And then you average the results and pick alpha to minimize the average mean squared error. So um, recall that in K folds cross validation, for example, you have five folds, you estimate the model on 80% of the data five different times, right? And then you make predictions on the remaining 20% and then the test MSEs are averaged. So I put that there because I didn't remember that. And I was like, why are you, what exactly are you averaging? But so this is just K folds cross validation. So then once you have this value of alpha from your K folds cross validation, you return to the subtree from step two and you choose the subtree that corresponds to your chosen value of alpha. Okay, so 
tree pruning on the hitters data. So now we have the results of fitting and pruning a regression tree on the hitters data using all nine of the features. Um, so what they did, and this was interesting to me, so they randomly divided the data set in half first. So 132 training observations in training and then 131 in the test set. And then they built the t naught, the large regression tree on the training data and varied alpha, as we said, in the cost complexity function, right? To create subtrees with different numbers of terminal nodes. And then they performed a six fold cross validation to estimate the cross validated MSC of the trees as a function of alpha. Okay. And so this is the unpruned tree. And then here, that's so small. I'm sorry. Um, okay. Maybe if you also so maximize you your window there rather than. You're only using a little bit of your screen this. real estate. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Still, it's kind of small. small. Yeah. Okay. Let me see. Um, maybe view. Oh, oh that's yeah, better yeah. already. Right. Okay. That's a little bit better. Okay. So here yeah. we have, you know, the training cross validation and test MSC are shown as a function of the number. Oh, okay. Number of terminal nodes in the prune tree, right? Um, and then these are just standard error bars. And so you can see here, uh, as, no, as usual, you know, the training error is going to decrease as the complexity increases. This is just tree size. And then uh, here is the cross validation error, which you used to pick alpha. And then this is the test MSC. So they say, you know, when they um, say test, the, they mean, so they held off the test is with the other half that they didn't use, right? That's yes. I, I believe yeah. that's okay. what it is, yeah. So this is interesting to me because um, the minimum cross validation error, right, occurs at a tree size of three. So around here, a little bit, maybe here. Um, and that makes sense because it does match the test, you know, um, mean squared error. But I'm like, but this test error actually goes down at 10, right? That's the lowest value there. So why go through this cross validation, um, you know, rigmarole? when you could have just applied it to the test set and gotten a lower MSC, you know, with a, a tree size of, of 10. And I'm thinking maybe this is just this specific data set. Cause I'm like, I get why, you know, you have like a, that parameter alpha to sort of index your trees by complexity and then uh, while you're cross validating. But, but if you're just getting a lower test MSC regardless, you wouldn't need to choose. I guess my question is why did they choose three? Yeah, I mean, maybe I guess it's, it's, to my way of looking at it, it's true that 10 is maybe a little bit less, but three is also a lot smaller. So hmm. I don't know if it's really worth all the added complexity to get a little bit better test there. Maybe that's why, that's just me thinking out loud though. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that's what I was thinking, right? But in a sense, um, the they mean kind of just don't talk about error, though, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the mean squared error already takes into account complexity, right? That's that's essentially what it's. Yes. Meant. It's the the bias variance trade off. So I'm like, so if that's the case, right? And it's all reflected in the test MSC. I'm like, you should just pick this. But you know what? Maybe you're right in terms of like interpretability. Like if you have, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, a tree that is so complex, it's sort of like, it's not as easy to decipher as that final tree where you had, you know, just like the, the two splits. Yeah, I mean, all they say is though it takes on its lowest value at the 10 node tree, they don't say anything more about it. So I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's my only thought is it was well, very complicated with the 10 nodes, so. Right, 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 right. That, that makes sense. Okay. Difficult to um, interpret. And difficult you almost to get interpret, as good. Yeah. You almost get as good for three, so. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Um, okay, so classification trees. So these are obviously very similar to regression trees, right? Except we're predicting a qualitative response. Um, we predict predict that each observation belongs to the most commonly occurring class of training observations um, as opposed to the mean. And in the classification setting, the RSS cannot be used as a criterion for making the binary splits. So a natural alternative to the RSS is the classification error rate. So the fraction of the training observations in the region that don't belong to the most common class. And so this is given as uh, error is equal to one minus the max uh, subscript k of p fitted mk so this p fitted mk is the proportion of the training observations 
in the nth region that are from the kth class. So, um, however, this error rate is unsuited for tree-based classification because E doesn't change as much as the tree grows, so it lacks sensitivity. Um, so, um, two other measures are preferable. One is called the Gini index or Gini index, and this is just given by this equation. And this is essentially a measure of the total variance across the K classes. So, um, the index takes on a small value if all of the P hat MKs are close to zero or one. And for this reason, the Guinea index is referred to as a measure of node purity. So a small value indicates that a node contains predominantly observations from a single class. So that makes sense. An alternative to this Guinea index is cross entropy and is given by this equation. And they're both uh, very similar numerically. Okay, so let's look at an example. So this is a classification tree for the heart data. So the data contain a binary outcome, heart disease. So it's yes or no based on an angiographic test. And they have 303 patients who had chest pain. And so they're including in the set 13 predictors uh, like age, sex, cholesterol, and other heart and lung function measurements. And then uh, cross-validation yields a tree with six terminal nodes. This is just the unpruned tree. Um, so here is the, on the left-hand side bottom, the cross-validation error training and test like we saw before, right? And then this is the prune tree corresponding to the minimal cross-validation error. So one, two, three, four, five, six, yeah. So um, note that classification trees can be constructed if categorical predictors are present, right? So for example, the first split, I think it's thallium is categorical. So right here in the unpruned and then in the prune tree. And it's hard to see, but uh, it says thal colon A, right? And that just indicates, the A indicates the first level of the predictor, which is normal. And then I think it had a B, C other levels that could be included. So additionally, you should notice that uh, some of the splits yield two terminal nodes that have the same predicted value, right? So for example, this rest ECG here, both have yeses. And so why is this split performed at all? Um, so it says because it leads to increased node purity. So all nine of the observations corresponding to the right-hand leaf have a response value of yes, whereas seven out of 11 of the corresponding to the left-hand leaf have a response of yes. Um, so why is this node purity important? So suppose that we have a test observation, right? That belongs to the region given by the right hand leaf, right? So then you can pretty much assume that that response value is yes. In contrast, if a test observation belongs to the region given by the left hand leaf, then the response is probably yes, but it's less certain. So even though the split rest ECG less than one doesn't reduce the classification error, it does improve this Guinea index and the entropy, uh, which are more sensitive to no purity. So that's how you would interpret that. Um, okay, advantages and disadvantages of decision trees. So trees can be displayed graphically and are very easy to explain to people. So they tend to mirror human decision-making and they can handle qualitative predictors without the need for coding dummy variables, right? But the thing is they don't have the same level of predictive accuracy and they can be very non-robust. So a small change in the data can cause large changes in the final estimated tree. Um, so in order to improve performance, we can use an ensemble method, which combines many simple building blocks, right? Regression or classification trees to obtain a single and potentially more powerful model. So ensemble methods include bagging, random forest, boosting, and Bayesian additive regression trees. Okay, so bagging first. So this is also known as bootstrap aggregation, and it is just a general purpose procedure for reducing the variance of a statistical learning method. So often used in the context of trees. Um, and so if you recall that a given set of N independent observations, Z1 through Zn, right? Each having a variance sigma squared, the variance of the mean of all of those observations is given by sigma squared divided by the number of observations. So in a sense, averaging a set of observations will reduce the variance. Um, 
But this is not practical because we generally do not have access to multiple training sets, right? So what do we do? Um, so bootstrap, so we take repeated samples from the single training set, and then we wanna generate B different bootstrap training data sets, and then train our method on the B bootstrap training set to get um, a function, uh, essentially the prediction of point X, right? For the bootstrap set. And then you average all of those predictions to obtain this like bagged um, prediction. Um, so in the case of classification trees for each test observation, you record the class predicted by each of the B trees and then take a majority vote. So the overall prediction is the most commonly occurring class among the B predictions. And also note that the number of trees B is not a critical parameter with bagging. A large B will not lead to overfitting. So, yeah, okay. Um, so now how do we estimate the test error of a bag model, right? So it's actually pretty straightforward. So because we're fitting trees repeatedly to bootstrap subsets of observations, on average, each bag tree uses about two thirds of the observation. So this, this seems to be the case for uh, bootstrapping generally. And then the yeah, leftover that, one third. It's, it's an interesting thing because that's actually one of the an yes. exercise we had to do at the end of the bootstrapping chapter, which I was glad I did now because it came, came back to <laughs> You the, actually did it. Okay. Yeah. I, I read it off on the slide somewhere where they were saying <laughs> that's usually what happens. So I was like, oh, yeah. okay, well, that's good to know. Um, yeah. So then the leftover one third not used to fit the model, right, um, are called out of bag observations. Therefore, you can predict the response for the i observation using each of the trees in which that observation was out of bag, right? Um, so this is, uh, they'll give you B divided by three predictions for the i observation, and then you just average them. So this is essentially the leave one out cross validation error for bagging if B is very large. So that makes sense. Okay, variable importance measures. So bagging results in improved accuracy over prediction using a single tree, but it can be difficult to interpret the resulting model, right? So we can't represent the statistical learning procedure using a single tree anymore. And now it's not clear which variables are most important to the procedure, right? Because uh, we have many trees, each of which may give a differing view on the importance of a given predictor. So which predictors are important? So um, an overall summary of the importance of each predictor can be achieved by recording how much the average RSS or Gini index improves, that means decreases, when each tree is split over a given predictor, right? And then you average overall your B trees. So a large value means that is an important predictor, right? And so here again, a variable important spot for the heart data, right? Um, and you can see Thal, which was the first split in the tree, uh, having a very important, and then all of these in, in decreasing order. Um, interesting, okay. Okay, so random forest. So a problem with bagging is that bag trees may be highly similar to each other, right? So for example, if you have a strong predictor in the data set, most of the bag trees are gonna use that strong predictor in the top split so that most of the trees are going to look similar, plus the predictions from the bag trees are going to be highly correlated. So averaging many highly correlated quantities does not lead to a large reduction in variance as averaging many uncorrelated quantities. Now, I don't know exactly why that is. Um, do you know, Ron? Like, if you have correlated quantities, does not lead yeah, to... Yeah, I mean, sure, quantities. like if you... Um... Uh, I'm trying, I mean, I do understand that, but I'm trying to think of a good way to say it. Okay. The point is, if you, there, if let's say you had a bunch of correlated samples, right? So the samples aren't independent anymore, and you average over them, you're not, it's not the same thing as you don't get the square root of n anymore because it's really the n, there's a less, there's a smaller effective number of samples because they're correlated. Ah, so the square root yeah, of n effective yeah. is going to be not as, as nice as square, uh, as, it's going to be smaller than the square root of n, so you're going to have less reduction in variance, right? Yeah. The correlation yeah. means you have yeah. less effective, at least effectively less samples. I mean, I'm using that word ineffective because that's something you use in the Bayesian uh, mm -hmm. Monte Carlo Markov chain where you do get highly correlated samples and you have to worry about this. Oh, uh, yeah. No, yeah, yeah. I, I see exactly what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. But in any case, you can just make up any kind of, yeah. 
I'm gonna write that down. So hold on one second. So less affected. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so a random force uh, can overcome this problem, right? By forcing each split to consider only a subset of the predictors. So typically it's just a random sample where M is equal to the square root of P, like the number of total predictors. So at each split, the algorithm is not allowed to consider a majority of the available predictors. And so essentially this P minus M over P of the splits do not even consider the strong predictor. So it gives other predictors a chance. This decorrelates the trees and makes the average of the resulting trees less variable and therefore more reliable. And so the only difference really between bagging and random forest is the choice of predictor subset size M at each split. So, so if you build a random forest using M equal P, that's just bagging. So for both, again, we build a number of decision trees on bootstrap training samples. Okay, so now an example. So random forest versus bagging, and this is on the gene expression data, right? So this is a very high dimensional biological data set. It contains gene expression measurements of about 5,000 genes um, on tissue samples from like 350 patients almost. So each of the patient samples has a qualitative label with 15 different levels. So it's normal or one of 14 different cancer types. And we want to predict cancer type based on the 500 genes that have the largest variance in the training set. So again, they randomly divided the observations into training and test set and then applied random forest or bagging to the training set for three different values of M. And so we can see here that, um, where's the M equals P? So essentially this random forest is giving you a lower test classification error, right? than uh, the case where M is equal to P, which is just the bagging. And then I think they just threw in this, you know, using half of the predictors as a comparison. Um, so the random forest lead to a slight improvement over bagging, as we can see. And um, a single classification tree has an error rate of around 45%, which is pretty high, actually. So, um, and here we are, let's see, a number, depending on the number of trees. So I guess less than half of, a, of the error that a, a tree gives you by applying, you know, these like ensembles. Okay, so boosting. I wanna make a note that uh, the title is wrong in this one. Okay, so yet another approach to boosting to improve, no, sorry. So this is yet another approach to improve prediction accuracy from a decision tree. And it can also be applied to many statistical learning methods for regression or classification, right? So in bagging, each tree is built on a bootstrap training data set. In boosting, each tree is grown sequentially using information from previously grown trees. So given the current model, you fit a decision tree to the residuals of the model rather than the outcome Y as a response. And then this new decision tree is added into the fitted function or model in order to update the residuals. So why? So this way each tree is built on information that the previous trees were unable to catch. Um, okay, so this is the boosting algorithm. Um, let me see if we need to go over this. So essentially, yeah, so you starting, you know, by setting your, your function to zero and then your residuals just equal to the response, yeah, for all i's. And then for b, um, each of your trees, you fit a tree uh, with D splits. So this D controls the number of terminal nodes to your training data. And then what you do is you update your model or F by adding in a shrunken version of the new tree. So it's controlled by this parameter lambda. And you update the residuals, right? And um, then you just output the boosted model. And here, um, 
F hat X is just the decision tree model or your residuals. D is the number of splits in each tree. So essentially that controls the complexity of the boosted ensemble. And lambda is a shrinkage parameter, um, which is just a small positive number that controls the rate at which boosting learns. So typically it's set to 0.01 or 0.001, but often the, you know, the right choice can depend on the problem. And so in boosting, each of the trees can be small, right? With just a few terminal nodes that is determined by D. And by fitting small trees to the residuals, we slowly improve our model in areas where it doesn't perform well. And then the shrinkage parameter lambda slows the process down further, allowing more and different shaped trees to essentially attack the residuals. So unlike in bagging and random forests, boosting can't overfit if B is too large. And again, B is selected via cross-validation. Okay, so now an example, boosting versus random forest. So this is essentially just the same, where you know boosting is just giving you um, a better result than the random forest. Uh, and actually boosting with a D equal to one is giving improved results over a D equal to two. So, uh, we want to notice that because the growth of- Just to be clear, D equals one means there's only one split, right? And so I'm just- No, I think that that's just the, um, what was it? D is- Yeah, one split, D split, sorry. So I'm just, I'm just subtracting- Yes, I'm, I'm yes, making a split. I think so, yeah. I'm making a split, then I update some shrunken version of this. So I subtract that out to get a new set of, basically a new set of data to fit. Is taking mm -hmm. account this first split and then I do it over and over again. Okay, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds hard to interpret. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so because the growth of particular trees, right, takes into account the other trees that have already been grown, um, smaller trees are su typically sufficient, right, versus random forests. And then uh, it also did say that random forests and boosting are among the state-of-the-art methods for supervised learning. Um, but again, the results can be difficult to interpret. I thought I'd just throw that in because then uh, that gives you an idea as to maybe these are good to use if you're doing supervised learning. Um, okay, and then the last section is this Bayesian additive regression trees, also called BART. Um, so again, let's just review. Recall that in bagging and in random forests, each tree is built on a random sample or of data and or predictors, and each tree is built independently of the others, right? In boosting, each tree is built to capture the signal that is not yet accounted for by the current set of trees, right? So this BART is actually related to both, but what is new is how the new trees are generated. Um, and the book only covers BART for regression, not classification. So first let's go over some notation. So K is gonna be the total number of regression trees and B the number of iterations that the BART algorithm will run for. So then uh, F K of B X is the prediction at X for the Kth regression tree, right? Used in the B iteration of the BART algorithm. So at the end of each iteration, uh, the K trees from that iteration are summed up like this for for each iteration, yeah. Okay, so now the BART algorithm. So in the first iteration of the algorithm, all K trees are initialized to have one root node, right? So it's just one over NK, the sum of um, from one to N of just the response, right? So it's the mean of the response values divided by the total number of trees. So for this first iteration, B is equal to one. The prediction for all K trees is just the mean of the response. So um, they had this in the book, but it's just essentially this, which is, yes, it's the mean of the response. Um, on iteration two and on, right, um, BART will update each of the K trees one at a time. So in the beef iteration to update the K tree, what you're gonna do is you subtract from each response value here, the predictions from all but the K tree. So this right here, so did not reach one. And you obtain this partial residual for the ith observation, right? So now, rather than fitting a new tree to the partial residual, BART chooses a perturbation to the tree from a previous iteration, this thing. Um, 
favoring perturbations that improve the fit to the partial residual. So it's uh, a given set of perturbations that you can do. And uh, essentially to perturb trees, you change the structure of the tree by adding or pruning branches, right? Or you change the prediction in each terminal node of the tree. So then the output of BART is a collection of prediction models, right? Given by this for all the iterations. Okay, so I included the BART algorithm. That's essentially the same. It was just a little bit more concise. So you're setting everything to just, uh, uh, at your first iteration to the mean of the response, right? And then for each um, iteration, for each subset of trees, you're computing this partial residual um, and then perturbing a tree by randomly, you know, um, or actually you fit the new tree by randomly perturbing the tree from the previous iteration. And then perturbations that improve the fit are favored. And then you compute this, um, and then, yes, additionally, is that uh, the first few prediction models obtained in the earlier iterations, right, known as the burn-in period, and they're denoted by L, are typically thrown away since they tend to not provide very good results. And this sort of reminded me like when you throw away the first pancake, right, that you make, because it's not good. Um, okay, yeah. so... Additional details on BART. So a key element of BART is that it, a fresh tree is not fit to the current partial residual, right? So instead, we improve the fit to the current partial residual by slightly modifying the tree obtained in the previous iteration. Um, so this guards against overfitting, right? So it limits how hard the data is fit in each iteration. And then additionally, the individual trees are typically pretty small. And so BART, as the name suggests, can be viewed as a Bayesian approach to fitting an ensemble of trees. So essentially each time a tree is randomly perturbed to fit the residuals, that is like drawing a new tree from a posterior distribution. Okay, and then finally to apply BART, you need to select the number of trees K, the number of iterations and the number of burn-in iterations L. So they say, you know, typically large values are chosen for B and K and a moderate value for L. And they give us examples like you can have um, 200 trees and then maybe a thousand iterations and then you just toss out the first 100 um, of those. And then um, BART has been shown to have impressive out of box performance. Uh, that is, it performs well with minimal tuning. Okay, and that is it. I wonder how that works. Is it like when it says favorably, does it, is it like a Barkov chain Monte Carlo where it sometimes will take a worse perturbation? With you know, like you know that you know, mark of the metropolis algorithm will sometimes move in a bad direction to try to you know to properly explore I the think probability space. They did say something like this at the very end, so not here. Um, yes, so algorithm oh. eight point three can be viewed as a Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm for fitting the BART model. <laughs> Forgot so I read that already. <laughs> It's been a week or two. <laughs> what is a Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm? Uh, well, I mean, in general, it's any kind of algorithm where you combine the, you know, the Monte Carlo part just means you're using probability to select new uh, sample points in the Markov chain okay. simply means that the probability distribution of the next sample point depends on what the previous sample point was. Ah. The, so that's the Markov property. Yeah. Markov part, yeah, part, yeah. part of it. Oh, I see. Okay. It's only the coolest thing all ever in all of numerical. Is it? To me anyway. I think it's really cool. <laughs> I see. Anytime I get to use Markov chain Monte Carlo, it makes me smile. <laughs> I see. Yeah, I should. Uh, I've heard of hidden Markov models, but then I was like, I think that that's probably something different. Yeah. Or at least based on, but not. Okay. Well, but it's really heavily way. used in the Bayesian statistics. Right. 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 To estimate the distrib the posterior distributions. Ah, uh, I see. Okay. I'm gonna write that down. Markov. So I just wonder if that actually does do like a 
thing where like sometimes it'll, it'll make a perturbation to a tree and it'll take it anyway just by some random chance. I guess it must, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't be Markov chain Monte Carlo. I mean, there's a random mm -hmm. part about which perturbation it does. There's also a question whether it does a randomness on whether it accepts the perturbation or not. I think it should. Oh, otherwise, it'll get it'll only explore. You know, it'll miss certain possible trees it could look at. Because right. you know, you make a change here. That might make it slightly worse, but then you make another change, you get to a new place you couldn't have gotten to otherwise with it where it's much better. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah almost yeah, like yeah. a simulated annealing type thing too, right? Where you purposely will sometimes move in the wrong direction. I see. Okay. So I, I'm just in, guessing because I don't they don't give any details of the algorithm here. And I know in the lab I didn't do it, but I looked and all they do is they just use a library and they just say fit, you know, and you're done. I see. I see. <laughs> I don't like that. Yeah, I, don't like yeah, these, yeah. I don't like black boxes too much, but oh, I should look <laughs> in the other book. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They do say that in BART, they say um, each tree is perturbed in order to avoid local minima ah. and achieve a more thorough exploration of oh, the model Oh, okay. So that, that kind of answers the question. Okay. I think, yeah. So then it yeah. would accept, like, bad perturbations. Um, yeah, with some like probably, right. Yeah, okay. Interesting. That's better with the, well, anyway. Cool. All right, well, great. Yeah. Good stuff. And I guess the others will have to enjoy the video version, but it, I think it'll come out really well because uh, you, everything was really smooth and everything uh, was very clear. So I think it'd be awesome. Amazing. Yeah, I um, I overwrote and then had to, I guess, to use the terminology, prune back my slides because I was like, <laughs> it's like a wall of text. I don't even want to look at this. And so, I'm, okay, I'm glad. I'm glad that uh, it was clear. That, that's the approach I use too. I usually put too much and I prune back. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. That's, that's how you write, right? I mean, you have to you have to just free write. Just I'm just gonna put everything in here. Then you go back. Okay, this is too much. I don't have time for this. This is not that important. You know, yeah. That's true. Yeah. For me, it's always like, uh, oftentimes I often write too much, and then I always have to be pruning things back. Yeah. It was actually nice to just see it on the on the rendered like uh, you know slides, because then I was just like, oh boy, that looks awful. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> Okay, yeah. so that sounds good, Ron. So next week, then we can go wow. over the lab. Yeah, you know what? The actual slides on the site um, for chapter eight are almost like uh, not the exercises, but the lab that's in the book, oh, okay. sort of interspersed with um, some videos that it's from StatQuest, I think, which are actually helpful. So it might be useful to either go over some of that if people want to, and then do the um, bring your own questions. Yeah. Works for me. Okay. Sounds like a plan. Right, I will see you next week. Thank right, you. Thank you. you for being here. Okay. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> Bye.